Um, speaking of grief, when we last left Saul, uh, Samuel was grieving over him because Samuel knew that Saul had fallen away. Uh, he had uh, failed to repent of his sin. Um, and it wasn't like there's some sort of perfect repentance that was needed. He had, in fact, with a high hand said, no, I've done no wrong, it's their fault. And he'd done so in the face of God's prophet. He has promised the kingdom will be ripped from him, and then he proceeds to uh, go on and do it again, to go on and blame the people, and to then even blame God himself. He also asked the prophet to remain with him, not so much so that he would be saved, but so that the people would not turn against him. Uh, Samuel, in spite of all of this, loves Saul. He grieves over him. Yeah, that's, a, that's a powerful thing. He also, nonetheless, continues to have his own sin. He has assumptions about what a king should be, uh, what a true king should be would look like and act like. And uh, God, through David, is going to uh, break some of that, even in, in Samuel. Uh, so God sends Samuel to uh, another house. This is not unlike what happened before, only uh, before he had to go out and, and, and find the man who came to him. But then in front of all Israel, they do this whole casting lots thing, and it all gets narrowed down to Saul, who's hiding in the baggage. Well, he goes to now a, a household, the household of Jesse, who is of the line of Judah, which makes a lot more sense than Saul having been of the line of Benjamin. Um, you may remember Judah is the fourth son of Leah, also fourth-born son of um, Jacob. Um, they're all from the same mother initially, um, before then later you have like Joseph being born to Rachel and whatnot. You had Reuben, Simeon, Levi, Judah. Reuben loses the heritage by uh, sleeping with one of his brother's moms. Okay, um, So uh, Jacob does not give him the heritage, the, the, the covenant promise. Um, Simeon and Levi have this, I don't know if we covered this in here, this bizarre action. Not bizarre, it makes a lot of sense. Their sister Dinah is raped by a young man named Shechem, who is the prince of a city called Shechem. And then he wants to marry her, and so they make an agreement with him, if you have all the men of the, of the uh, city circumcised, then you can marry her. Um, Shechem convinces the people to do this, geez, right? Um, <laughs> convinces the people to do this by saying, look at all their flocks, because they were very wealthy. Jacob had so many flocks, he got all these flocks from Laban, you recall, he stole them more or less. Um, very wealthy, and they say to the city, look, it, we'll, we'll increase our wealth, our wealth tenfold by, uh, by marrying into this group. So they go ahead with the circumcision. But as you know, or maybe you don't, before antibiotics, cutting things with metal on your body usually meant a fever, yeah? Quite a deep fever where you're not going to really be up and around. And so two days after the circumcision takes place, uh, Simeon and Levi single-handedly Go into the city and kill every male while he's sick. Stab him. <laughs> dead, 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 dead. Um, Jacob's not too happy about that. Um, and, and he says to them, you know, you've made me a stench in the peoples around us. because They think now we're a violent people. Here we are with all these flocks and all this money. We don't got an army. What, what are they going to do to us now? Uh, nonetheless, when the covenant blessings are given at the end of Genesis... These guys don't get it. It comes to Judah. Judah, who is the guy that sells Joseph into slavery, but is also the guy who says, who says when, when bartering with Pharaoh for, um, for Benjamin, take me instead. Uh, so there's, like a, there's a repentance story in Judah. Um, anyway, Jesse is a, a grand, great-great-grandson of, uh, of Judah. Samuel goes to his house. And uh, they do the lot casting thing uh, a little bit. No, it's not even that, though. He brings out, uh, Jesse brings out his firstborn. And his firstborn is not unlike Saul. Strapping, strong, tall. Samuel thinks for sure a king, a king like we should have. 
Um, and God says to Samuel, nope, not him, not him. Um, and this happens several times, and Samuel doesn't understand. Chapter 16, verse 7, God says to him, interesting words. The Lord looks at the heart. Now, we've talked in here about the problem with English and that our words that are the best translation of Hebrew words nonetheless come with baggage that the Hebrew word maybe doesn't have. So, there was no tinkerbell in ancient Israel telling you to follow your heart. Yeah? For us, the heart and, and looking at the heart is all about this emotive um, wishfulness, which really isn't there in Hebrew thinking. But it would be very easy to read that into this. That, so somehow, the Lord looks at the heart as some sort of like good news in that he's going to look at who you really are inside. And who you really are inside is who God is going to treat you like. But if you're a Christian and you study who you really are inside on the basis of the Ten Commandments, you find out that I don't want God to look at my heart. I want God to ignore my heart. My heart's a problem. Huh? I can restrain my hands. I can't restrain my heart. But that's not what God's saying here about looking at the heart as if David is somehow this pure and perfect human being who's really, really authentic on the inside. What he is seeing is what's going to happen ahead of time. That God is looking for a man after his own heart, God's own heart. We've talked about this in here. A man not like Saul in that when confronted by his sin, he will have faith in that sinfulness and beg for mercy, which is exactly what then happens with David later. So when God is looking at the heart of David, he is looking at his sin and the fact that David knows his sin and that in spite of this, believes in the name of the Lord his God, which he will show uh, in, the, in the battle with Goliath. And we'll get to that as well. So if anything, what I want you to see here is that this word test, test, I don't know why this does this, um, is best translated as, in our heads, as faith. The Lord looks at his faith. Um, as Lutherans, you should know this anyway. Reformation, it's all about this. Faith alone. You know, the Roman Catholics never had a problem with grace. It wasn't about grace alone. That wasn't the problem. Grace is fine. Grace is the power by which you use your works to please God, according to Rome. But faith alone, that grace is only there to be believed in. That's what saves. That's, that's the problem between us and Rome and the Reformation. Um, so we should know this anyway, and then not let our English steal it from us. So God says to Samuel, no, I'm going to pick the man who will believe what I say. I'm going to go after that man. And they, they, they finally, they bring in all these different sons. Jesse had many sons, and none of them are, um, are good enough <laughs> uh, faith-wise, even though they're all more than good enough to the eyes. And finally, um, Jesse says, that's it. That's all I got. And Samuel's like, really? That's all you got? And Jesse says, well, well I got David. <laughs> you know, he's, he's out with the flocks but yeah you don't want David and Samuel says get David and David comes and um, it, it is interesting uh, it does say in the text he is ruddy and handsome so he's not an ugly man but he isn't nearly as powerful looking as his brothers in some way he just doesn't have the same imposing nature but, um, but he is ruddy and handsome it says Samuel then anoints David king. Christ's him, right? Remember, uh, Messiah is Hebrew for anointed, um, which Greek anointed is Christ. He's christened. So he becomes the second Christ in the Old Testament. Not the final Christ, right? The reason we call Jesus the Christ is because the Christ is the anointed one in the line of David being Christ. He's a son of David. It's a way of saying son of David, yeah? Or king like David was, only better. Um, he's anointed, um, and then Samuel goes on his way, but then here's the thing. He's anointed king, but there's already a king. So now you've got two kings, and you'll, we'll see this, hopefully, as we study David. Um, amazing thing about David is even though he knows he's the next king, he refuses to ever lift a finger against the former king because the former king is the Christ, the anointed one of God. 
and I will not lift my hand against him. If God has said I will be king after him and he will remove this man, then God will remove this man, and I will wait until he does so. You might remember this. When, when Saul is finally killed on the battlefield um, by a, a servant who Saul demands that he kill him, that servant runs to David and says, I killed him, I killed him, he's done, it's your, your king now. And Saul says, I'm going to put you to death because you attacked the Lord's Christ. It's not your job. Yeah. Um, fascinating faith in God's word. All at work there. Meanwhile, the text tells us very clearly that the Holy Spirit leaves Saul abandons him. No Holy Spirit. We know in the, in the Psalms when we sing, with David, take not your Holy Spirit from me, it's because God does that sometimes. He takes the Holy Spirit from those who do not repent. And David, after his sin with Bathsheba, is saying, I want to repent. <laughs> Let me repent. Keep me repentant. He saw it firsthand with Saul. When the Holy Spirit is taken from Saul, Saul's given another spirit by God, a demon. He has sent a demon by God to torment him. Um, God, bizarre and crazy thing. Um, probably hard enough, hard en- hardest, because we have this really horrible idea that God and the devil are like yin and yang somehow. You know, yin and yang is from uh, Hinduism and Buddhism. It's about balance and equality. If you take any yoga, beware. They're going to talk about balance. This, this is what they're talking about. The two, good and evil are really like hot and cold. Um, and uh, this is just totally wrong. There's God, and then there's his angels, and then there's his fallen angels, which broke away from him, but he's still, in fact, in charge of them. And if he tells them to jump, they will jump, because his word will make it happen. God sends the angel of death upon Egypt. Death is the last enemy to be destroyed on the last day. So we know God uses even the fallen things for his own purpose in Christ uh, to drive the cross to us. So anyway, he sends this spirit to torment um, Saul, and this is going to have some some ramifications for uh, uh, Saul and David and their interaction, but it is also found very quickly um, that David, as an instrumentalist, can soothe Saul out of his fits of rage that he gets into with the spirit. And so... Um, David ends up in Saul's court, in his household as a a musician, um, playing to to soothe Saul. Um, But, do we have time? Tell me we have time. Yeah, maybe. Zooming in on, oh, is there any extra papers? I don't have one. I gave them all away. Um, Thank you, Dwight. Appreciate it. Let's try to do some of David and Goliath. In the midst of all of this, the war with the Philistines is still going on. That hasn't stopped, right? They're still raiding parties and, and lined up across a, a valley from most of Saul's troops up in the northwest. Um, the zoom then of 17, 1 through 54 uh, is, is what happens. Now the Philistines gathered their armies for battle, and the Philistines stood on the mountain on one side, and Israel stood on the mountain on the other side with a valley between them. And there came out from the camp of the Philistines a champion named Goliath. Does anybody have in their study Bible what Goliath means? Can you find that? I'm really curious. I don't think it means big. Like, we think it's big, right? But that's because of the story, not because of what it means. No? All right. Um, I should have looked that up. I'm sorry. I want to know. Um, anyway, a champion named Goliath of Gath, whose height was six cubits. A cubit is 1.5 feet. So 1.5 times six, nine or so, right? I mean, I should say 1.5 feet, it technically is the distance from here to here. And so depending on how tall you are when you're measuring or how long your wingspan is, you know, your cubit would come and go. But 1.5 of these, around nine feet. And a span, which is six inches, which is from tip of the finger to the base of the palm. Right, so you imagine before rulers and tape measures, you know, you're sitting there going, you know, one, two, three, four, five, and half a span kind of thing, right? Um, kind of cool. I mean, I- ingenuitive at least. Um, so Goliath was anywhere from seven to ten feet, somewhere in there. He had a helmet of bronze on his head, and he was armed with a coat of mail, and the weight of the coat was 5,000 shekels of bronze. That's 125 pounds. Um, 
It's my understanding that a, a firefighter's coat is maybe like 50, maybe it's 75, something like that. Pretty heavy. Um, 125 pounds. This is his armor, which he's wearing to protect him while he, while he fights, while he moves. And this isn't like plate steel where you could like not have to move at all because you're inside of this entire um, protection and no one can get to you. This is just chain mail. So he still has to be able to move in this. So he's, he's, he's big, right? He's strong. And he had a, a bronze armor on his legs and a javelin of bronze slung between his shoulders. The shaft of his spear was like a weaver's beam. A weaver's beam was a thick cylinder up to 2.5 inches in diameter. So the, the shaft of the spear is huge. Huge. Um, and his spear's head weighed 600 shekels of iron, 14.5 pounds. Um, not easy to swing around uh, if you're you and me. Guy is a monster. His shield bearer went before him. He stood and shouted to the ranks of Israel, Why have you come out to draw up for battle? Am I not a Philistine? And are you not servants of Saul? Choose a man for yourselves and let him come down to me. If he is able to fight with me and kill me, then we will be your servants. But if I prevail against him and kill him, then you shall be our servants and serve us. I defy the ranks of Israel this day. There should be an end quote there. Um, you ever seen the movie Troy? Brad Pitt. Not a bad movie. Um, uh, and I forget who's the, who's the guy who plays Hector. He's, I like him better than Brad Pitt. Um, sad story. Uh, but there's a moment at the start of the movie and at the end of the movie where you have this sort of one-on-one -on -one champion battle for, for all that is um, fight. And it's... It's a powerful idea um, that uh, rather than have the two armies fight, uh, you'll just have um, uh, the champions engage in mano e mano, you know, winner takes all um, combatant. Actually, if you watch, I can re I can uh, recommend this kind of with a, a careful. It's it's PG thirteen slash R, but the new Marco Polo that Netflix has done has a great moment like this as well in it. Very good show so far. Meredith and I are watching it. Um, there's a moment where Kublai Khan uh, has to fight uh, his brother, and their armies are lined up, and they, they kind of uh, they do this mano y mano thing. But keep in mind that this isn't just about men versus men. This is about gods as well. You have um, the gods of the Philistines who... Uh, when he says, am I not a Philistine, he's talking about it. Do I not come from, from these... This culture with this religion, uh, uh, the gods of the sea who are with us. And are you not of Saul? Isn't Saul the one who's been anointed by your, your most high God? Yeah? Uh, well, so, send him out here. Let's see. Let's see who's God's really God. Yeah. Um, 11. When Saul and all Israel heard these words of the Philistine, they were dismayed and greatly afraid. Oh. Understandable. We're human, but really, who's got the most high God? Well, they do. Oh, well, but Saul doesn't, does he? Oh, yeah, Saul has chosen not to believe in him, has hardened his heart against him, has had his spirit taken from him, and is now tormented by a demon. How many people know this? And yet the Ark of the Covenant's there. God's still there. Samuel's still prophesying. What will be? Um... We're not going to be able to go further. That's such a good story. Um, we will pick up in two weeks. I think that's right. Um, I will be back Sunday. So next week I'm in Peoria. You got James May. Two weeks. I promise we'll get through Goliath. Um, and then we have, there's an ACELC thing coming up, which will have a video and stuff um, sometime on a Bible study. I think that's three weeks from today. Um, God, I want to I want to get to the end. It's so good. Um, but we'll have to wait. Let's th thank you for being open this morning, too. I, again, it's, it's hard. Uh, I welcome your comments. Grab me after church. Uh, call me, email me. I will, I will make myself available to you. Let us pray. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Lord God, just as Goliath of Gath stood before Israel and decried uh, their God and their king, we know that this world stands against us and decries uh, you, uh, our Christ. 
And uh, we, we pray that as David had a heart which trusted in your word, you would continue to make us trust in you, uh, no matter what the present may come, no matter how big the enemy may be, even though that enemy be our own death, which one day will find us, uh, that we would trust in uh, our champion, our, our Savior, who has broken the bonds of death uh, and shattered the skull of the enemy uh, by stamping on it with his bruised foot. Uh, we pray this uh, uh, knowing that you give these things to those who are hungry for them, those who starve for your righteousness. Make Bethany a place that always indeed looks for that righteousness and so is filled by your word. Uh, in, in your name, Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank you.